and one in particular pressed in Ted Bundy because he was literally the worst person I've ever heard of. He's known for it's being really attractive and just luring people. Ying Ying Zhang was a student who graduated from Peking University in Beijing, China in 2016. In 2017, she traveled to the U.S. to do a year abroad to research photosynthesis and crop productivity. She did her research at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. If all went well, she would pursue a doctorate degree at the University of Illinois as well. It all changed on June 9, 2017, which is when she would disappear. She planned on signing a lease for a new apartment off campus on that day, exactly at 2 p.m. Since she didn't have a car, she used public transportation to get around the city. She would have to take two buses to get to her off-campus apartment, and she was running late for her 2 p.m. appointment. At 1.52 p.m., she got off her first bus and tried to catch her second bus. Unfortunately, she was on the wrong side of the road and missed her second bus. Due to a public transportation policy, the bus was not allowed to wait for people that were across the street, as this could put pressure on them to cross traffic to get to the bus quickly. Surveillance showed a black Saturn Astra passing by her at 2 p.m. as she was waiting for another bus. The same car circles around and stops to speak to her. It's 2.40 and the leasing agent hasn't heard from Ying Ying. It's not until 9.24 p.m., almost seven hours later, when a professor calls the police to report her missing. The FBI became involved and tracked down a black Saturn Astra, with the same characteristics as the one that Ying Ying was seen getting into. The campus police noticed two specific characteristics of the car that would crack the case. A large sunroof and a cracked hubcap. The investigators remembered one of the first people they interviewed had a Saturn Astra with a large sunroof. When they looked at the car again, they noticed a chunk of the hubcap was missing. When the investigators got a warrant to examine the car, they looked in the car and noticed the inside of the passenger door looked overly clean compared to the rest of the car. Luminol would later reveal that it had been previously covered in blood. This car belonged to a man named Brent Christensen. Christensen was a recent student at the University of Illinois and had graduated with a master's in physics a month before Ying Ying's disappearance. Although he appeared calm and reserved on the outside, Christensen had deep self-esteem issues that would manifest into a violent and wicked mind, as we will see. During the investigation, the FBI got a hold of a video recording that was taken during a therapy session. Christensen had a few weeks before the disappearance of Ying Ying. Interestingly, Christensen agreed for the session to be recorded. He wanted the notoriety that other serial killers received. This sort of attention would be the ego boost he always wanted. And one in particular pressed in Ted Bundy, because he was literally the worst person I've ever heard of. He's known for it's being really attractive and just luring people, just the way he talks, he's, mm. he's definitely curious. Mm. Um, and I was fascinated by that. But as time progressed, I realized, um, although I am smart, and I have proven that more than once, I'm probably not a genius. I don't so know. curious about what the, the thoughts were, like how far, do you like imagine yourself doing something similar? Or? I was pretty far along, and I, I, I never tell her this. Um, like thoughts, plans, plans. did you ever like purchase anything related to the plans? Yes. Like um, about like all of the things? No, no. Like how far along you got? Like um, you about like following people or ever getting like physical altercations or identifying specific people? Um, not specific people. That's probably a type I would have went for. Um, not really, though. Now we will look at Christensen's interrogation, which took place six days after Yang Ying's disappearance. As we ease into the interrogation, the investigators start off laid back and non-confrontational. This is known as the behavior analysis interview stage. The point of this stage is to create rapport with the suspect and to get a sense of his or her baseline behavior, which is obtained by asking seemingly harmless questions related to topics such as work, hobbies, or the suspect's background. To get a sense of Christensen's truthfulness at the beginning, the investigators will ask a few behavior-provoking questions to see how he responds. Based on this analysis, the investigators can create an interrogation plan that will be best suited to obtain a confession from this particular individual. In this case, they are quick to build up Christensen's ego, which will make him think that he has the upper hand and can fool the investigators, thus making him more relaxed and likely to speak about the incident. 
Uh, would you uh, graduate in? Uh, master's in physics. In physics? Yes. Wow, that's way smarter than me. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's over at the U of I there? Yes. Okay. The interview is completely voluntary, and Christensen uses this opportunity to try and get insight on what the cops know and don't know about the case. Do you have any questions for me before? Um, um, why am I under suspicion? Is it just my car, or is there anything else? Uh, I mean, that's, you know, a large portion. Uh, I mean, it is uh, a very unique car. Um, like I said, our search warrant is, uh, is just for the car, yeah. so we can... Yeah. You know, um, look into it. We can, of course, see what we can find. And of mm -hmm. course, you could also turn around and exonerate you completely. I mean, talking about okay. a very rare car. Yeah. So. We see a shift in the interview at this point. The interview will transition from behavior analysis and information gathering to a direct interrogation. First, we see the positive confrontation stage, meaning the investigators will present evidence that shows Christensen's guilt. The supposed evidence isn't always definitive but it is rather speculative. The investigators will claim that they saw him in the car, but as we see in the footage, the car and license plate cannot be seen clearly. The interrogator's high level of confidence when making speculative statements can be enough to get someone to confess if they feel like the evidence is inescapable. Notice Christensen's immediate change in tone from confident to completely distressed. And you know what we have access to? Cameras. Do you think that we're not going to track a vehicle all over campus? We control kiosks to bus stops. We can look in buses. We can look in every building out on the streets. And you're telling me that I didn't see you driving down Wright Street and turning on right in front of parking where everybody pays her tickets. And then you see her standing on that corner in that shade tree, didn't you? That's where you first saw her. I've seen the videos. I didn't see me. You've seen what we've allowed you to see. Can I see this stuff that you're talking about? Do you think that we brought you up here to show you video? We want to we want to understand why you did it. Yeah. We want to understand why you stopped her to pick her up. Was it to give her a ride? Are you afraid to tell us that you gave her a ride? Maybe you wanted to make a couple bucks as an Uber driver and she told you I had to go get it. I had to go sign a lease at One North, and you're like, oh, I know where that's at. I'll drop you off. If you're afraid to tell us that you gave a ride someplace, we can work with you there. But I know that you picked her up. I know you did. I saw you in your shirt, arms fully extended. Where did you drop her off at? She was looking for a ride. She had missed her bus. She told you she was going to One North, so where did you drop her off at? Okay. I thought I was a random Saturday. I did pick a girl up. I don't remember where. Okay. I saw her picture. I don't think it was her, though. Do you remember the girl's name that you picked up? No. She was talking very broken English. Okay. Tell us about what happened. What time of day was that? Early afternoon. I don't really remember. Okay. I was just driving around. Um, I saw a girl, and she was very distressed. Okay. So I stopped my car and looked at her. Okay. I asked her if she needed help. I talked to her for a little bit, not how much. I gave her a short ride a couple blocks. Okay. She freaked out and got out. Okay. And that's all it was. When you say she freaked out, what did, what did she do? Did she, did she start throwing things at you? Did she scratch you? It looks like you have a scratch on your right bicep there. Is that oh, from... I scratch myself in my sleep, that's for me. The following text messages are between Christensen and his girlfriend. We will see Christensen admit that he is the one that picked up Ying Ying, but will deny any wrongdoing. For context, Michelle, who is referenced in the text messages, is his wife. From Christensen, you cannot tell this to anyone, literally no one but Michelle and I. From his girlfriend, tell what? I was the one who picked that girl up. I dropped her off shortly after. I didn't do anything wrong. 
but she is missing and I am officially the last person who saw her. They took my car. They took our computers. I understand why you're frightened. They haven't found her. If they get desperate, I'll delete this conversation. I believe you. I am the last person. Why did you pick her up? Michelle told them everything she knows about me. Everything. She looked like she needed help, and she did. Was she lost? They know all my secrets. Now we are in the theme development stage, where the investigators are going to present justifications for Christensen's actions. The investigators develop a theme that is based around his open marriage with his wife. They will propose that he was jealous of his wife's other romantic interests, and he felt emasculated and lonely as a result. The idea is to get Christensen to admit to the crime while being able to blame outside circumstances, thereby not having to take full responsibility for his actions. You, you mentioned your wife went on vacation with another friend. Um, you mentioned that uh, there's another guy she hangs out with. You mentioned there's another girl you hang out with. Do you guys have a we're no, we're fairly open relationship? Open relationship? Okay. Yeah, I have a girlfriend. She has a boyfriend as well. Okay. Um, so I'm kind of stirring between us as well in an unrelated way. Okay. It's not because of the open relationship, it's just a strain. So um, I, every marriage goes through some rough patches. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean... How, how long has that been going on, that, that strain? A few months. A few months. I mean... Yeah, I mean, I didn't tell her that I did this because I was scared that, I mean... Well, great, now well, this is happening. I didn't want to tell her. Did she go to Wisconsin with the boy or another girlfriend? Guy. Did that, how'd that make you boyfriend. feel when she went away for the weekend, this long weekend with that guy? Lonely. Yeah. And it's okay, those, that, those are normal human feelings. Yeah. Did you feel hurt? Well, yeah, but, I mean, she's been seeing that for a while. Um, but still, she's your wife and it's tough, you know, even if you're in an open relationship like that where it's tough to see somebody you care about that you love to go someplace else with somebody else and mm -hmm. not include you. Mm -hmm. And I get that, man. Is that why you're driving around campus all day, pretty much all day long on Friday? Because you missed her? I'm trying to clear my head. Yeah, more or less. That's understandable. And I'm stir crazy. I was lonely. It is not typical practice to have a table between the investigator and the suspect, as is the case in this interrogation. Normally, this would be the point in which the investigators would need to hold Christensen's attention by moving physically closer to him. They need Christensen to relay specific details about specific times, which can be used to contradict him later. Christensen will resist and will provide vague answers with no specific admissions. The investigators will then shift their questions to minute details and will attempt to get him to agree with one detail at a time. While you're cruising around, you saw Miss Ying Ying. Um, she appeared very distressed. Okay. Is that correct? If it was her, yeah. I mean, again, I don't... If I recognized her, I would have told the agents that came on Monday or Tuesday, whenever it was, that it was her. Okay. Like, because I knew she was missing. Um, I picked up an Asian girl. I thought she was about 20. When she said she was distressed, uh, or you said that she looked distressed, what did, what did she say to you when you rolled your window down and talked to her? Um, she said she was late for something. Other than that, did she, she tell you what, what it was? She or said she had at? a meeting with her professor. Did she tell you where it was at? Yeah, but I didn't understand her. Okay. So, so did she offer to pull up the address in her phone? Um, and show it to you? I think she did that in my car. I don't remember her getting out her phone outside of the car. If a suspect isn't admitting to key details, then an investigator will often give reasons for the suspect's actions. Getting the suspect to agree with one of the reasons for his or her actions is one step closer to a confession. Do you, do you have, I'm gonna ask you a weird question. And, you know, a lot of us have fetishes. How would you describe your relationship with your wife? 
Are you guys into certain things? Do you like porn? Do you like... Um, we're pretty vanilla together. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, that's pretty much it. We have some stuff in our apartment. I mean, do you have like certain types of people that you have fantasies about that you might want to hook up with? You know? Not particularly, no. Well, I'm going to step up. Okay. I mean, have you ever, like, um, you do realize, like, everything you tell us, we fact check regardless of what you tell us. So, yeah, like, stuff like uh, YouTube videos that you've seen okay. regarding Asian women. Do you like videos of Asian women? K-pop songs and stuff? I mean... Maybe. I like, okay, so I like all types of women. Okay. And that's, that's the truth. So, I don't have an Asian fetish. But something drew your eye to her. Christensen had extensively fantasized about kidnapping. He joined a website called FetLife. And the following messages are part of a larger conversation he had with another user. We will see how thought out and detailed his kidnapping fantasies were. The standard is that I'd break into your house and be waiting for you and jump you when you least expect it, or get you while you're in the shower. For logistics, I just need to know what times you'd be alone in your house. I think it could add an air of suspense if you don't know exactly when it'll happen. I'd bind you, gag you, and likely put you in a large duffel bag so no one could see you. After I get you in the trunk slash back seat, I think for safety reasons, I'll check to make sure you're okay. And I think using something like a single piece of duct tape during this part would be preferable since if something bad happens, you'd actually be able to take it off your mouth and get my attention. I'd take you to a motel. We'd try to pick one where neighbors won't be a huge concern. As far as I know, I have no real limits. It's really up to you to decide what we can't do. I can look into the letter of consent more. I doubt it has to be too detailed. Now we will continue with the interrogation. The investigators will try to appeal to Christensen's humanity to determine whether he shows any remorse. Because Christensen maintains his innocence, the interrogators show their humanity towards Christensen by repeatedly saying that they understand him. Do you have any sisters? What, wouldn't, wouldn't, if, if your sister was missing, even if, if it was because of you, wouldn't you want to help for the closure for that family, for, for your loved ones? You have to know, you're a smart man. You have a PhD, right? Masters. Masters. Oh, you just got out of the PhD. You're still a smart man, is my point. So you have to understand how technology works. How do you think I knew that she Googled the address to One North? How do you think I knew that? You need to be honest with us. Help us put this to rest. Help us bring her back to her family. You can do that. You can do that. You can do it right now. I understand if you've had dark thoughts. I understand if you've been depressed. I understand if you've been drinking too much at times. I understand if you've had sadistic thoughts, wondered what it would be like to commit an act of violence. I know that temptation is out there. I need to find her. I know she got in your car. You went with her. You've been depressed. Your wife just left to go on a vacation with another man. You see her, she gets in. She's vulnerable. Let me find her. While Christensen did admit to parts of the evidence presented to him, like the fact that he picked up an Asian female on the day in question, his admission did not constitute a full confession. He was therefore released while the investigation continued. On June 16th, the day after his interrogation, Christensen was put under constant surveillance. His girlfriend agreed to wear a wire, thinking that recording him would help exonerate him if he was innocent. Yeah, the last thing I'm gonna do right now is break the law. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. I still think they're monitoring me. Why do you say that? I thought they were, like, not following you anymore. Oh, I, no, um, I am pretty sure my place is wiretapped. I'm just kind of assuming. Mm. It's a safe assumption to make. As in, they might be paranoia, but it's, um, a paranoia I'm willing to yeah. entertain. On June 29th, everything changed. 
Christensen attended a memorial walk with his girlfriend and proceeded to get drunk. This is the recording that his girlfriend captured while on the walk, which was used in his trial. How many years since there's been anybody better than you? Hmm? How many years since there's been anybody better than you? Better at this? Or like, not better, but like more people or more successful when you were Tough texting to say. me? It's tough to say. Didn't you say it was like 30 or 40 years? Yeah. Since there was someone to this level? Okay. We can stop talking about stuff. I know no, I want to talk about it. It's... Is it hard to hold in? I don't want to talk about this with someone so much. I'm holding it so long. Okay. The last person I would consider at my level that actually did anything was Ted Bundy. He was caught in the 80s. I told you I'm in 13. I talked to you. So long. I think I'm bored. Part Sounds of the like Yang didn't bore you. Hmm? Sounds like Yang didn't bore you. <laughs> she bored you? Yeah. She did. I just don't want to be by the road. I feel weird yeah. just come out the road. And I need to be on that side so I feel like <laughs> funny, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so now I know I'm. What does that make me? Huh? What does that make me? There are a thousand different things you can talk about. I know, but like. I, my version of Safer is looking at my sister. Yeah. That's me. You know, it's so strange. <laughs> so weird. I don't even know how to process it. It's just all those people there tonight. They want to home safe. And it's just. <laughs> they talk about it. You have no idea what happened. <laughs> you know what you know what happened. Nobody will know what happened. Me. Hmm? And nobody will know what happened. <laughs> Not even you. Like, I'm the only one who was happy. You're the only she one. She was. You know, you're the only one that knows where she's at. She was Ellie. She was. She was. What? She's high. More than anyone else. Really? Yeah. A little she Chinese was. girl? Mm-hmm. More than anyone else. Does she really have broken like, English? Did she, did she say anything to you? Yeah. She thought what you were all set up in that. She believed. She was happy. Hi. Mm-hmm. No? Yeah. She did. She did. She did. Well, it's because. I wanted to see her reaction. She fought more than you once. I've ever been. She was stronger than me, not so that I didn't knock her out. I cried, but gave up. You'd be surprised. There has been no proof that he has ever killed another person other than Ying Ying. Ted Bundy became famous and received positive attention from females. It appears that Christensen yearned for females to give him that kind of attention. There was overwhelming evidence that showed Christensen was guilty, including DNA evidence throughout his house. After less than two hours of deliberation, the jury found Christensen guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The jury was unable to reach a unanimous decision in favor of a death sentence, however. Was life without parole an appropriate punishment? Do you think there are other victims? Thank you for watching and join me next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.